Of course. Yeah. I do the rap stuff, Baron's a stand up. But don't try to brand us or put us in handcuffs for fans up. Joe's and got some music too. It feels new, but it's not confusing. New Negro, some people are scared of. A word of a scene they was not aware of. We heard you believe what the media get told you. Them old ideas get blown up. Behold a new Negro. This, that, and a third. Man, you say you seen it all and you sound absurd. I'ma tell you one you for sure ain't heard. I'ma tell you one you for sure ain't heard. Yeah. Yo, hello. Welcome to the New Negroes. That's right, the stand-up show that answers the question, guess who's coming to dinner? It's us. I'm Baron Vaughn. And I'm Open Mike Eagle. How you guys feeling tonight? All right. Who here is in therapy? Couple people, couple people. Was it your father or your mother that drove you to that? Oh. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. You're in therapy, right? I am, yeah. How is that going? Oh, yeah, really good. Been helping a lot lately because I've been a little stressed out. <laughs> but we don't need to go into that right now. But Baron, this is a safe space. This is our show. The point of all this is to be who we want, say what we want, hmm. live how we want. So be new, Negro. Be new. <laughs> all right, okay, well, you know, I've been, uh, I've been juggling a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I got this show. Right. I got my home life. Got a new baby. Juggling a baby. Very dangerous. Yes. Um, <laughs> seriously, though, all this brings up, like, this old self-worth stuff, you right. know? Because right. I'm like anybody else. I, sometimes I conflate self-worth with net worth. Dang. You know what I'm saying? But I'm figuring out it's going to be what it's going to be. Go ahead. Talk about okay, it. Okay. What about you, Mike? Not going to talk about it. Mike, what? <laughs> Come on. Son of a motherless what? Y'all ready to bring up the first comment? Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Can we just talk about the fact that we are two black men talk about self-care on television right now? Come on. Very fair. Bask in this, right? Because for me, growing up, therapy wasn't something people around me talked about at all. My family never talked about it. Way too busy talking about Tupac. You know, we were just trying to solve that mystery. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because for a lot of black people, mm -hmm. historically, therapy has been branded... Uh, Bougie? No. Soft? Uh-uh. White, White people, people shit. shit. Yeah, yeah, that's what I used yeah. to think. I used to think that, too. Someone said, hey, maybe you should go to therapy. And I was like, that's some, that's some white people shit. And then I thought, wait a minute, white people don't own feelings. And then I thought, ain't nobody got time for that. And then I thought, maybe I do have time for that. Sounds like you had a breakthrough. I did, you know? You're right, because I mean, really, for the longest time. Ooh, it's... that's all we have time for this week? I'll have to pick it up next time. Oh, okay, you're gonna do me like a therapist and beat me at my own game, okay. You know who else has game? Who's that? Our next comic. Uh, oh, that's a transition. Um, <laughs> I met this comedian when uh, stand-up comedy was just a twinkle in her eye. Please welcome to the stage our emotional center, Naomi Ekparrigan. Yes. This feels right. And I'm convinced this applause is for the pants, and I'll take it. Right? Aren't they extra? Hello. I try to be extra and just enough. <laughs> I've been trying to practice self-care lately, okay? But what I usually do is not hitting the spot no more, you know? Because normally for me, how I refill the well, okay? How I take a breath um, is by watching a lot of true crime and listening to true crime podcasts. You know, it gives me a much needed perspective, honey. It really does. I was watching one of my jams on Investigation Discovery, which you know is the channel, okay? <laughs> I was watching one of my jams, and it was an hour-long show about a woman in Wisconsin who was locked in a box for two months. And I was like halfway through this show, and I was like, I'm doing all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, even on my worst day, I'm not living a box life. <laughs> and that is crucial, you know? You gotta keep that in mind. Plus it's like, so like on one hand that's good, but then at the same time, I think now I'm like getting too upset about it. And it's funny, cause my fiance, he always knows when I'm watching true crime, cause I'll just come into whatever room he's in and start making pronouncements that make no sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, he'll be like at his laptop and I'll be like, FYI, I am never getting life insurance. <laughs> He's like, all right. <laughs> but it's true, because you know
know them true crime shows. Life insurance is a target on your back. You, have you seen this stuff? It's like literally half these shows are just two people who are in love and another person kills somebody. And it's so depressing though. It's like gets me because sometimes there'll be these like small town murders, you know, where they'll kill each other. Like a husband will kill a wife for like a $20,000 life insurance policy. 20,000 or like 30,000? Can you imagine? Okay, I'm like, if you need to come for me, you better kill me for the full cost of my liberal arts degree, okay? You know? Thank you. You know. It's like, don't kill me for a semester. There's something I've noticed, you know, especially, you know, as more and more people have rescue dogs. Um, and I'm just hoping you got, like, like, let's talk about it. You know, I want to uh, really hang a light on that moment. Um, and that is what I call canine-based racism. Okay, also known as racist dogs. And what is happening is that people get these rescue dogs and then graft a personality onto the dog, you know, which really tells me everything about their issues. You know, like, because I'm like, they're like, I don't know what happened, you know. Uh, we rescued him. I don't know what he went through, but... He seems to be afraid of Mexican men. Okay, no, that sounds like your issue, okay? It's serious, because trust me, I know. I watch Dog Whisperer, okay? I know what happens. What happens is you see something scary, you tense up, the dog feels that tension, it's a feedback loop, and you're racist, okay? That's what it is. And I've lived this, okay? I have lived this experience. I had a coworker, she was gonna bring her dog into work, and she says, like, half an hour before the dog is gonna come, she goes, Okay, Naomi, um, I don't want you to freak out, um, but he can be kind of aggressive around black women. And it's like, was he abused in a Dominican hair salon? <laughs> what reason would there be for that? So she, t I got 30 minutes to this dog come, so now suddenly I gotta bridge a gap. I gotta be this dog's gateway Negro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's suddenly private school all over again. I gotta do some work in here. But the difference is, you know, like when it's a white girl, you just go, I love your outfit, and then your friends. But this is an animal. This is an animal, I gotta do something different. So I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Can I give him a snack? She goes, yes. I go to the office kitchen, I get some turkey pieces, put them in my hand, you know, and the dog comes in, and she was not kidding. That dog looked at me and was just like, rawr, rawr. it was rude, <laughs> okay? I was like, I cannot believe you coming in hot. And so I put my hand down, <laughs> with the turkey, and the dog has to assess, does it love turkey more than it hates me? You know? <laughs> and it's this moment, the dog ain't making a call. And then finally, like, sniffs out the turkey, and it, like, is eating out of my hand. The dog's about that turkey, starts running in a circle around me, accidentally sniffed my clitoris. I was like, we are in. I felt so good. I was like, I have bridged a gap. I was like, I can solve America's race problem, <laughs> okay? I was literally, I was like, okay, somebody get me Mitch McConnell on the horn, <laughs> all right? Imagine, I know how to get McConnell, y'all. I feel like if I took some dry chicken cubes to his gummy little lips, to his little slit of a mouth, I could probably get our rights back. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> Thank you guys so much, that's my time. This next comedian is a real thug, but the kind you find in a musical. Please welcome to the stage, Kevin Avery. I went to college in the South in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, so there were things going on then and there, trends, styles, fashions, whatever, that weren't happening anywhere else in the country, nay, the world. <laughs> For instance, at one point in the South in the 90s, it was in fashion, I swear to you, it was in fashion for young black men to walk around wearing knee-high riding boots. And, look, yeah, I know now. Where, where were you then? Uh, look, and I don't know why I thought these were cool, I guess because Han Solo wore them, but he had a Wookiee in a ship with him. I just looked like some dude, you know, perpetually riding side saddle wherever I went. And look, I, see, I can see your faces. I see a lot of you judging me, but you know what? We've all done that thing where you put on the outfit that makes you feel self-conscious the second you walk out of the house. You know what I mean? Like, as soon as you walk through the threshold, you realize, this is wrong! Like, I definitely had that moment, but I just kept on walking like a douche, man. I found out later, the friend who loaned me those boots was gay. Which, I feel like that's something you tell someone before you lend them your frickin' riding boots, you know what I mean? Like, hey buddy, there's a reason I wear these, you should stand down. And look, I, you know, 
And he was one of my best friends, and he, you know, he's having a tough time. He's coming out. I wanted to be there for him. You know, no, I didn't know who to turn to. It's so hard. I didn't know what to do. But the whole time, I'm just looking at him going, goddamn boots. Like, that was all I could think of. <laughs> I would tell this story to friends years later, and they all had the same response. Well, didn't you know he was gay? Couldn't you tell he was gay? Well, no. He was a black guy in the 90s. <laughs> yes, right in the R&B 90s. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? In the Cisco gold hair, thong song, 90s. Look, let me explain something to you people. If you were black and gay in the 90s, you had to be gay. Because you were competing against straight dudes walking around in big baggy hammer pants, floating in the breeze, and white silky shirts with sparkles in them, and patent leather shoes, and you know, hair that was all wavy and processed and gumby to the side. Like, if you were black and gay in the 90s, you couldn't just come out of the closet. You had to kick that shit down. Like, nigga, I'm gay! You would demean that. You had to be aggressive about it, because here comes boys to men, and they're in yellow jeans. You know? I miss that decade. It's the 90s, because of those groups, man. That was the last time, that was like their last era of singing groups. And I'm not one to normally put uh, something entirely on white people. <laughs> but I'm putting this one on you. White people ruin singing groups. Because we had a good thing going. We had a legacy, a whole history. And then white people came along with New Kids on the Block and invented the boy band. And that's not the same thing. The simple difference, uh, singing groups still hold up. I saw a new edition just a couple years ago. Still got it. Still matching. You know? I, saw, I went to a reunion of New Kids on the Block, and those dudes came out, and I was like, wait, why are all my dad's coworkers on stage? It was... <laughs> <laughs> they came out like, hi, we're New Kids on the Block, and we're here to tell you about a unique business opportunity in real estate. What? They have way too many songs about my portfolio. <laughs> here is the key to a solid singing group. It's the names of the members of the group. Jodeci is the best example. Four members. You got Casey, Jojo, Mr. Dalvin. A name that says, yes, I'm with the band, but I must carry this briefcase with me at all times. And number four, Devante. Devante. Uh, male or female, we should all hope to be fucked by a Devante in our lifetime. I hope it happens tonight to all of us. What are the names of the boys of Backstreet? You got the aforementioned AJ, you got Howie, you got Nick, you got Brian, who's the last one? Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is not a cool singing group name, and my name is Kevin. <laughs> if you are ever at a concert and you hear a woman screaming, oh my God! Yeah, that's someone's mom looking for them. That's all that is. <laughs> you guys, thank you very much. I'm Kevin Avery. Good night. <laughs> this comedian coming to the stage right now is a man I truly admire and respect. Please welcome Alonzo Bowden, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever Donald Trump gives a speech, I look at white people the way you look at me when Tyrone robs a liquor store. You know that are you involved look. This, this administration, we have reached an unprecedented level of racism. Like this administration is so racist, they don't even need white people for their racism anymore. Cause they have Ben Carson. Yeah, exactly. Let me explain to you the relationship between the black community and Ben Carson. We forgave OJ. <laughs> ben Carson, your ass ain't welcome back. You ain't welcome. <laughs> ben Carson said out loud in front of people, he actually said that slaves were just low paid immigrants with bad hours. <laughs> And it was so ridiculous that the day he said it, Samuel L. Jackson tweeted, motherfucker, please. <laughs> and the beauty of that is there is no one on earth more qualified to call you a motherfucker <laughs> than Samuel L. Jackson. 
right? If Sam take time out of his day to call you a motherfucker, guess what? Oh, <laughs> you's a motherfucker, yeah. <laughs> right? And he would know because he played Ben Carson in that movie Django. <laughs> not good. <laughs> Getting older, man, things are changing, right? Like being single now, being single now, like you want to date somebody, you got to get an app, right? You got to get, right? You need a dating. And I don't mess with the apps. I'm a little, but, but I like the websites. You know, I do. I like dating websites because I have more room to fix my fake profile. <laughs> I'm on all of them. I'm on farmersonly.com. <laughs> I am, and I put up the blackest profile I could think of. I told him my name is Leroy Lincoln Washington Jefferson Jackson Jr. You know, black people like them old president names. So I ain't got a farm, but I got a garden in Compton. Right? Got to be careful now, man. Got to be, you know, guys are finally learning. You have to respect women, right? And and it's funny now. Like we have the whole Me Too movement and and men are getting nervous like oh my god i don't know how to relate like like it's it's about them it's about the women like they guys i don't know what to do so fellas i'm gonna help you out if you're watching i'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this now pay attention i'm an old vet i've been around for a while i've learned a few things if a woman wants to see your penis she will let you know <laughs> that's it that's the whole rule that's the whole no woman has ever been happily surprised by a penis. You know what I'm saying? No woman's ever been in the copy room like, Joe, wow, I've been waiting to see that. No. And I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of the stories with black women and brown women, and I think there's a reason for that, because every black and brown family has a cousin that don't mind going to jail. You know what I mean? Like, you mess with a black woman, you're like, all right, don't let me have to call cousin Jay nut. Jay Nutt will have his ass down here in a minute. He don't mind doing time, you know what I'm saying? Like, right? like, like you're a Mexican family, like, ah, I'll call Chewy. I'll call Chewy, because Chewy be right down there, you know? But if, but if you're a white woman, like, you can't call Chad, right? right? Chad ain't gonna help you. Chad, like, well, I believe we can start a lawsuit. No, Chad. I'm Alonzo Bowden, thank you. Baron, I was at this party the other night. Oh, yeah? You get live, you get hype, you crump dance, you turn up? <laughs> no, I didn't do any of those things. But it was lit, and what decade do those phrases come from? Um, the 40s. Tell me about this party. I can't tell you, but I can show you. We made a music video depicting the experience. Y'all want to see that? <laughs> Here it goes. I've been laying here for hours like I'm melting into this couch. I'm off with four or five pills I never felt them get in my mouth. I'm trying to take a few more cause there's a feeling never can chase. But I got no hand-eye coordination. There's pills all over my face. I got pills all over my shirt and some drink to spill to my lap. It's either that or I piss myself, but I really hope it's not that. I stay crewed up, I stay crewed up, so you know I'm never alone. When they wake up, I'ma ask my homies, can they help me out of these clothes? We at the party, this is it. We ain't doing shit. All we do is sit and wait. Shit, then drink a whole fifth. Oh, my doctor gave me a brand new script. Mr. So don't pop down for you, dry yo. No, I drove my whip. Yeah. Everybody in the club, free with full 10. Had to get in, no, I brought my friends. And all my friends, how off them been so Smoking out the wall on Nindos. Everybody swear they my kinfolk. Try to play me like Nintendo. And I'm so high that I let down window. Somebody get me out this hole. I don't need really. We at the party, this is it. We ain't doing shit. All we do is sit, and baby, this is lit. Baby, this is lit. Yeah, baby, this is lit. One more time.
time for Open Mic Eagle and Father, everybody. And um, that's our time for this week, okay? So if you know someone who's going through a hard time, please dial in to our national help hotline. It's 1-900-MIX-A-LOT. Yeah. And share, share them nasty thoughts. Good night. Good night. Friends and all my friends, how often been so smoking out the wall on Mendo's. Everybody swear they my kinfolk, trying to play me like Nintendo. And I'm so high, I let go. Somebody get me out this.